don't know. I oh, know I will. Come here, Molly. Come. Come. Good girl. Good girl. Turn, turn, turn. Are you ready, Molly Moo? Are you ready? You good girl? Got your chicken here. Good girl, stay. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah. I'll come round to you. You got all the bits? Yes. Oh, they can't fit up there with my legs up. I know, don't she? And you, Molly. Good girl. Obviously, I'm Lucy. <laughs> I'm 22, and this is Molly. She's my assistant's dog. She's only recently qualified. That's why she's a little bit excitable at the moment. She qualified two weeks ago today. <laughs> so she's just, le just got, it's just beginning, really, where she's just going to start learning how to work in public, basically. That's going to be her job. But obviously, I'm here to talk about my charity work, which, apart from Molly, is my life. That's what I did, devote my life to, and for which I got my MBE in the New Year's Honours this year. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Good girl. Yeah. Good girl. Yeah, so my work is kind of with seven charities. Um, I work in numerous different roles from ambassador to trustee to lay member on committees. That's kind of my work takes the form of writing, of speaking, appearing in videos and attending events and representing charities. And it's, I've only done it in the last three years. It started in 2011. I said to my hospice nurse when I was doing my end of life plan, that I wanted my life to mean something. I was scared I'd die and I'd just be forgotten and that would be the end of my life. She never forgot that. She always kept that in the back of her head and when Together for Short Lives in 2013 said they wanted a young person to speak, she asked me if I'd do it. And my first ever event was Parliament. So starting at the top, as you do, and I gave my very first speech in the whole of my life. I'd never spoken before. And even when they asked me, Mum said, oh, no, no, she won't, she won't, thinking I was too scared to do it, really. But I wasn't, and I did it, and I got a standing ovation for my, for my speech. And uh, Dr Dan Porter MP, who is what was the Parliamentary Undersecretary for Health, said my speech was a hard act to follow. So it was lovely, lovely to hear him say that. But since then, it's kind of evolved. I did that first speech, and that kind of kicked it all off. And then it started, you know, my, my first work with a charity called Together for Short Lives, who are the children's palliative care charity for the UK. They were formed by two different charities merging and that's kind of how they started and I became what they called a Young Avenger. They have a transition task force and they're to do with the transition between children's and adult services. So they, they made me part of that but I also do more of an ambassadorial role for the whole of the charity. And that's kind of led to working with numerous charities now, doing all sorts, from, again from writing to speaking to appearing in videos that have been shown at conferences all over the world as far as Buenos Aires and as far as Asia. So. My, my reach is expanding all the time, my work is evolving, 
and I, I really enjoy it. It makes me feel good, but it also means I can make my life mean something. It can count, it can give back, and I can leave the world a better place than when I came in. And that is so important to me, to feel that my life has meant something. You know, that's why I do it. But it's so lovely when you achieve something, not because you do it for recognition, but because you do it because it's for the greater good of other people. And that's why I do what I do. And that's why I got my MBE, because obviously for services to young people with disabilities, a lot of my work has covered young people with life-limiting and life-shortening conditions. So that kind of how I got my MBE, but my work goes broader than that to all children with disabilities, all adults with disabilities, all people with life-shortening terminal conditions, palliative care, transition period, all sorts of things like that. And that's my reach of my work. I don't really stick to one little niche. I do all sorts so I can make an impact in different areas, not just one. I want to make the biggest impact possible. And that's kind of how I do. I've spoken at the Department of Health as well as Parliament. I co-chaired an event at the Department of Health last year um, for the Young People's Health Partnership, which was a huge honour uh, there. Co-chair, who was a, as a minister, stepped down, so they asked me to fill his role. So that was really, really lovely. And um, yeah, so my roles at the moment are Ambassador for Together for Short Lives, Global Youth Ambassador for the International Children's Palliative Care Network, Trustee of the Pseudo Obstruction Research Trust, Ambassador for Dreams Come True, who are a wish granting charity, and I'm a lay member on a NICE committee, so the National, Cl National Clinical, um, what is it? National Health and Care Institute, that's it. So I work with them and also with the National Council of Palliative Care, who recently took me on as their committee member. So my work, I do a lot of work and I really enjoy it. And, you know, things, I've appeared in a BBC Radio 4, The Listening Project. So Mum and I did this recorded conversation in 2014 that will be archived for future generations. So it's in the British Library, so that's going to stay. And this year, or last year, I filmed a documentary called Rest in Pixels about how our social media presence lives on after we die. And, you know, how, it can, how we can almost grieve through the internet now. You know, there's blogs, there's online sites, there's tributes, and how that's kind of developing in today's world. So that was really interesting for me to kind of delve... Because it's something I'd always thought about. I wanted to write some blogs and I wanted to make a video so that I would live on, on the internet, even after I'd passed away. So that was quite an interesting thing to delve into how my feelings about it, but also learn a lot about what is out there that I can use to make my life count and life live on after I've died. And yeah, so there's an awful lot of things I do nowadays that you know, are really, really lovely and really good for me, but good for other people as well. You know, I'm an advocate for others, so I speak up at meetings at the Department of Health for young people, for adults, for children, and share their needs, so bring the young person and the child's and the adult's need to the meetings. Because it's so easy for commissioners to make a decision on behalf of a person, but if they don't consult that person, they don't know that what they're doing is right. And that's my role, is to make sure that all the decisions that are made are in the best interest and are what patients want at the end of the day. Because if it's not what we need, there's no point making a guideline that doesn't serve the population it's supposed to. So we have to kind of work on that with them, with commissioners, with ministers, with charity executives, with Department of Health officials. I've done quite a lot of work with the uh, Department of Health officials on guidelines. Obviously with NICE now, I'm part of the guideline committee for end of life care. So over the next two years, we will decide what patients need and what needs to change and what the guideline needs to be to serve the population at the end of life for all adults at the end of their life, what they need, where they want to be cared for, you know, what their families need, because care at the end of life is not just about the person who is dying, it's about the family, the wider family, even not just the immediate family, but the whole family. I always say when, when a person gets sick, the whole family gets sick in effect, because everyone's lives are irreparably changed by that illness. And it's so important that carers' needs are factored in. You know, my mum cared for me solely with the help from carers, but they couldn't do my medical needs for seven and a half years. We couldn't get any nursing support because they said, you know, well, if you want a break, you can put her in a care home. So obviously we weren't going to do that. So mum kept on, but she got diagnosed with a brain tumour last year. So yeah, that was a big step. And we had three weeks before her operation to build a care plan from scratch, uh, build a care package from scratch. And it was really difficult because they considered going out, visiting my mum in hospital, doing anything, having a dog. That was all a, an unnecessary luxury, including hospital appointments. They considered those un luxuries. And they're not. They're not luxuries. And I've obviously now that it, re it reignited my fuel, really, to keep making a difference because they need to think about the carers. 
They could run a second NHS on the amount of money that a carer saves the economy every year, which is huge, but they don't get the recognition. And that's a new part of my work, is through, the, through Mum and I's experiences, is to raise the awareness of the carer's needs. And it's so, it's so important, because as I said, the whole family gets sick, the whole family is affected by the illness. So there needs to be support for the whole family, for siblings, for parents, for grandparents, for cousins. There needs to be more support out there, but especially for the carers who provide the care unpaid for their loved one. You know, they need to be important in the needs of the young of the person with the illness, not just the person with the illness, but their family, even their friends. You know, there needs to be bereavement support. There needs to be, you know, support groups. There needs to be caring to give the carer a break. It's like I always say, care packages are not just about the needs of the person. You need to factor in the carer again. But people quite often don't. They think, well, we'll serve their needs, but not their needs. And that's not how it should be. It should be carer and person's needs together and build a care plan around that. And again, building the care, plan, the care package around the patient. You know, it's so easy to say, well, you know, you can have this, but if it's not what the patient wants, that needs to change. It needs to be patient-centred, it needs to be personalised, and it needs to be, what do you want out of your life? And then that's how you start building the care and the services and, you know, everything around that person and their wishes and that population and their wishes. Because what's right for one area is not right for another. There's different religions, different races, different, you know, there's different people with different needs. And we need better care to support all of these people within the community, if, if possible. Because that's another thing, we need to prevent un, like un, unneeded admissions, really, unnecessary admissions. Because so often I can nearly be in hospital when I could be cared for at home, but there's not the support there for 24-7 services to allow people to be at home. And that's why people end up in hospital so often. The they say we want to care for people in the community, but then they don't provide the services to meet those needs in the community. But like palliative care, it's very much nine to five in the community. And you just think, well, people don't, aren't only ill or aren't only dying in nine to five, they're dying 24-7. It's, it's quite, there's a lot of work I need to do and a lot of work I need to fight for the needs of the patient and the needs of the family and the carers. And my work will never be done, I don't think, will it? And I won't ever stop. You know, even when I'm poorly, that's all I'm thinking about is the next thing, the next thing I can do. You know, what charity can I work with next time? What piece of work area I can work on? And it's, it's just so important to me to make my life count and to make an impact, not just for my own life, but the lives of others. It's, you know, using my experiences, positive, and negative, using them both, and making constructive differences out of those experiences. And that's, you know, that's kind of why I do what I do. But as I said, in the New Year's Honours 2016, I received my MBE. And I wasn't expecting it. I found out in November. And Mum, you thought um, that it said I'd just been nominated, that I hadn't actually got the award. I kept saying, no, no, I, they have, I have actually got it. No, 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 you're just nominated. So we had a little bit of a battle over that, didn't we? But yeah, it was only when the Cabinet Office phoned and um, said, oh, would you come up and be one of our representatives for the honours for this year, that Mum went, oh, yeah, you have got it. <laughs> yeah. So that was lovely. We've had, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. and I, It was such a short build-up. Because in February, I got poorly. And um, I was in and out of hospital for a long time. I had septicemia a couple of times. And it was just a really difficult time. So I didn't really get to enjoy the build-up to my investiture which is a shame. And I, I got a lot of opportunities through the MBE that I then had to give up because I was poorly. But I managed to get myself well for my day at the palace and what a day it was. It, something we will never forget for my mum, for me, my grandma and the nurse who was the envy of the rest of my team because she got to come with us. <laughs> so yeah, so um, and it was just a very special day. And you come into the, the uh, gates of Buckingham Palace and people being outside trying to take pictures of a car thinking it's someone important. And you just think, <laughs> really? I should have done my royal wave, shouldn't I? Yes. Yeah, and going into the actual Buckingham Palace, I cannot fault their disability support. I must say that they had someone with me all day. They had all wheelchair access, lifts. I didn't want for anything, which was quite unusual. For, a, for an old building, it's quite unusual to have all that kind of support there for disabilities. But, um, yeah, so when I got there, I was separated from my guests. So they went and stood, stood, sat in the ballroom, and I went with the other honorees mixed with a lot of them, met a lot of them, and I was the youngest one there, which is quite nice, and it makes it more special. I, was, I think I was the second youngest honoree this year. There was another boy that I think he's 11, and he got a British Empire medal. So that was lovely. You know, it's, it's nice that they're recognising the younger generations for their work as well. I never thought 
after three years' work that I'd be getting an MBE. But I can understand that they're valuing the work, not the length of time, but the impact of the work you're doing. And I think that's very important that you recognise the impact, because anyone can do something with a big impact, whether they do it over a short period of time or a big period of time. So it's nice that the Honours um, Committee is recognising younger people that are doing good work. And yeah, so we got separated from my guests and I met with the other honorees. We had a kind of briefing session, told us what to do, what not to do, most importantly. <laughs> like, you know, there was all sorts. And um, then it was, we went through in short groups. So I was thinking I was the second last group. Went into a room next to the palace, they brief, uh, next to the ballroom, they briefed us again. And then it was my turn to go in and my heart was racing. <laughs> but I was in a wheelchair, I wasn't going to fall over, so that's good. Someone nearly did, so I'm glad that didn't happen for me. And I didn't drive into the stage or drive or knock anyone over, so that's good. And yeah, I drove in, turned, bowed, um, went up to him and he was... I thought there'd be this kind of barrier between him and me, but he stepped off the stage to be at my level and he asked me about my work and he was very appreciative. He even complimented my wheelchair, so I think he's a bit jealous. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he was really lovely. He said to me, you know, you know, what have you done, you know, and keep up the good work. And I will never forget, though, I think it was two minutes that I was with him, I will never forget that. And even down to his, his handshake was even genuine. He cared about every single recipient. He wanted to know their story. He wanted to know what they'd done and why. And he was very genuinely appreciative of that. And I thought that was very lovely. I thought there would be this kind of divide between him and me but it felt like just talking to a friend which was lovely and then obviously my time ended about I shook his hand bowed my head and drove out and that kind of I kind of came out in a blur really I don't I don't really know what happened after that I went and sat at the back and <laughs> kind of took in but when the national anthem was played at the end of the ceremony that was really moving because it was a live band playing and you know you just it kind of dawned on me then even when I was with Prince Charles it didn't dawn on me but I kind of thought, oh, wow, I've actually got an MBE. <laughs> I am a Lucy Watts MBE, and I still, when I get letters now, I get surprised when it says Lucy Watts MBE. I still get, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. We've brought the DVD of my ceremony, if we'd like, we'd like to show it to you, if you'd like to see it. Shall we set that up now? She picks up dropped items, loads and unloads the washing machine, helps you get undressed which she loves doing. I think that's probably her favourite <laughs> exercise. Fetches the post. What else does she do? She fetches named items. She'll shut doors. And we're, she's always learning, so there's more things that she will accomplish as time goes on. But something that she has picked up herself, she will alert me three to four hours before my temperature spikes, which for me is very dangerous. I've got a line into my heart, so I'm very prone to infections that go straight into the bloodstream. So she will lick my hands and arms incessantly. For, she'll just obsessively lick them and lick them and lick them. And that's her way of saying, you know, you're going to run a temperature. So she lets me know what's happening before it happens, basically. I don't always listen. No. <laughs> I don't always recognise it. And she gets quite frustrated with me. But, yeah, so she's, she's learned that all herself. Don't know, all through scent, I think, apparently. <laughs>